Hello everyone, thank you for joining us here today for today's webinar with Stephen Burke. We'll get started in just another minute or two, just let a couple more people join in. Hope you're all well, let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from rural, rural Ireland, uh, West Coast, Galway, in the sticks as they say. Where are you tuning in from Stephen? I'm from sunny Kildare, just outside Dublin. We're suffering <laughs> a heat wave at the minute. It's about seven degrees Celsius. <laughs> There's the stuff falling out from the sky at the moment. I haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's called rain. Uh, okay, right. Well, I might we just kick off. Um, perfect. So, okay, everyone. So my name is Treva Stankard. I work in channel marketing here at Tyne HQ. I'm thrilled to bring you this webinar today as part of um, the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're doing a couple of initiatives um, here at Tyne HQ, and I'll just bring you through them quickly. I'll just change my screen here. So yeah, we're doing a big campaign around Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we've created a couple of free resources for you all to avail of. Some of them include um, a security awareness training quiz, a security awareness training planner, we're doing this webinar, and we're doing multiple security awareness ebooks and guides. So I'll link them resources in the chat here in a little while, but um, they're all there for you to enjoy. And then today we have a great webinar store for you, as I said, a part of the Security Awareness Month with security expert CISO Stephen Burke. As we all know, security awareness is not just for October, but it should be all year round. In this webinar, Stephen will bring you through key factors to assure your business is secure. So just some housekeeping before we start. The webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a recording shortly afterwards. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. We'll try to make this as engaging as possible. Uh, if you're shy, we um, we can leave them to the end. And then uh, we'll have a short, web or a short survey at the end just to get your feedback. So just take a moment to let us know how you enjoyed the webinar. It's great to hear what you think. And then just to give a quick, a, a quick introduction uh, to Tiny HQ for those who aren't familiar. So Tiny HQ is a best-in-class cybersecurity platform uh, based in Galway, Ireland. We deliver uh, cybersecurity solutions to MSPs. So we're established. Uh, we start. We're established in 1999 in Galway, Ireland, and we have an office in Shelton, Connecticut. We offer solutions uh, for your or GS or sorry, we provide solutions for advanced security threats. So we have a couple of different uh, solutions such as uh, DNS filtering, security awareness training, email security, and we've got a new one coming up. Uh, it's going to be launched later this month with Fish Titans. It's going to be a powerful phishing solution. So that's enough of me talking. I'll hand over to you now, Stephen. I'll just share the screen with you now. Thanks a million, Treva. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, just Bear with us two seconds while we get to share my screen, which is great. Now, hopefully you can see that, everybody. Tree view, if you can confirm that's there. Yeah, yeah great. Okay. okay. So, thanks a million, Treva. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks a million for everyone for taking the time out of your day to, to join us on this session. I'm kind of super excited about this one, to be honest with you, because uh, I've introduced a few new slides that I haven't uh, presented before. Uh, hopefully you find them to be informative. And if anyone has any questions or follow-ups after the session, by all means, reach out to me. Uh, I'll have my email address at the end. Um, but as I say, uh, who am I? Um, Stephen Burke, I founded Cyber Risk Aware in 2016 off the back of being a Chief Information Security Officer. My passion is security awareness training. It's about empowering staff. It's about helping organizations create an awareness culture within their organization. It's about helping companies implement a network of human sensors, if you will. Some people have referred to that as the human firewall. I'm going to be off piste with network of human sensors. And trying to be there in the moment of need for staff is kind of where I see the future for security awareness. It's not just schedule training and schedule phishing. Um, and that's been my passion for many, many years. But today is about navigating cybersecurity risks beyond just security awareness training and really about how we manage risk, the threatscape and whatnot. And one thing I did want to bring in was um, cybersecurity is like a marathon. 
Uh, why? Because I'm a marathon runner. Uh, I recently completed my fourth uh, marathon in Berlin. Uh, this is me uh, getting to the finish line. Hallelujah moment. Um, I'm hoping to finish the six majors. I've done three of the six and uh, looking forward to finishing them. Um, but definitely cyber is like a marathon. And I have a few uh, bullet points that I want to talk about that uh, just to, to hook the two points, if you will. Um, but I'm a member of Titan HQ for several years now. Um, as a company and as an organization, our products really focus on end user compromise. Um, the competitive advantage we bring to MSPs and end users is that we try to prevent attacks from getting in to organizations with our DNS filtering, our email filtering and whatnot. But if something does get through, it's a question of how can we mitigate that in, at the inbox? And then if somebody you know, does actually get something, then we've raised awareness with our security awareness platform. So we're trying to join the dots and complete the loop so that we're preventing that end user compromise, which we all know is probably the root of most incidents that's out there. But I think it's something that can be addressed in the right way. We can help users in the right way. So from an agenda today, as I said, cyber is like running a marathon. I want to talk about that. Bear with me as I, as I go through that. We'll talk about the threatscape, who the threat actors are, Cyber as a business risk, again, it's always about a business. It's not just about us and IT and IT security talking about this. There has to be a reason and it's about protecting businesses. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about ways to effectively manage cyber risk. And I'll call out as to what I have observed um, taking place, but what I've done and what others have done. Uh, and give some examples. Rather than speaking to this, I want to show how people can actually go to uh, quantify risk management at the dollar level uh, as opposed to heat maps which is more qualitative um, as opposed to getting into the, the nooks and crannies of the dollar values of these things and then why are we here obviously employee training and awareness but year-round cyber resilience and how can we look at that and how can we deliver that um, outside of October and then to wrap up uh, some takeaways some security controls to consider um, outside of security awareness training and as Treva said, if there's any questions, Treva will kindly moderate those questions, maybe ask me during the session, or we can do that at the end. OK. So given that we're in Cybersecurity Awareness Month, the month of October, um, it's hard to imagine that this is the 20th anniversary of this being created by the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency, otherwise known as CSAC. This year, they're really touting that this is year round awareness. It's not just for the month and they've called it Secure Our World. And it's about reminding us that there are simple ways to protect ourselves and our families and our businesses from these threats. And they've called out a few items here. And I suppose it's just to start off our session today around the use of strong passwords and password managers. Again, it's great to see the password manager advice being brought in here because historically us in security have said, oh, you need to have different passwords on different accounts they must conform to certain policies and people just didn't know what to do. They couldn't remember all the passwords. So they were writing them down. Of course, we then said, don't write them down. Um, but we never came in with you know, man password managers. Yes, some people have a fear of password managers. There's been some password managers in the news. Um, but I don't believe that passwords have ever been compromised in those breaches. It's more being the software. But don't hold me to account on that. And they are a good thing. Um, and they're definitely worth um, using in your personal life. I know I use uh, two in my personal life as well as my professional life. Multi-factor authentication, again, a no-brainer. We use them in our personal lives. We have to use them in companies. They do prevent 99% of incidents from happening. It is now a mandatory requirement in most cyber insurance policies that this is in place. So again, uh, definitely worthwhile um, implementing if not already done so. Recognizing and reporting phishing are either actual or suspected, massively important. If the faster we can detect means the faster we can, you can respond. And if the faster you respond means you're reducing the cost and the impact to an organization. And what better way than to have canaries in the, in the coal mine with people reporting these off the back of their training and awareness on their regular phishing simulations. One thing I will call out about regular phishing simulations, and I'll talk about this later in terms of how to uh, report back on the results to the board, but fishing simulations are not about shooting fish in a barrel. I get this question a lot. Oh, I disagree with that. Uh, we've, we're making people feel bad. It's very easily done. 
that's not the point. The point is that we're here to help show the latest threats that exist. And we're trying to raise awareness as to what is happening out there. And really, that's what a phishing simulation is about. It's, about, it's not about naming and shaming. I fundamentally disagree with that. Um, it's not about you know, making people feel bad. It's just about we're here to help you understand the latest threats. And here's what we can do about it. And then the last piece is updating software. Again, vulnerabilities exploit unpatched software. So if there's no vulnerabilities, they can't be exploited, which means people can't get onto your computer. Um, so again, vulnerability assessments and patch management, massively important. Right, so that's us getting into the zone on Security Awareness Month and the themes that have been brought out this year around Secure Our World. Now, bringing us back to Cybers Like a Marathon. Now, I'm going to run with this, excuse me, that's my first pun on this. At the core, whether running a marathon or managing cybersecurity, it requires teamwork. Right? You can't do this alone. Whether that be your MSP partner, whether that be your colleagues, whether that be your senior executive colleagues, IT colleagues, end user staff throughout the whole organization, everybody has to work together to mitigate cyber risks. Why? Because there is limited resources. When I'm doing my marathon training, I have very limited resources. I've got gels, I've got water. I have to, I have to use those in the best way possible. Same with um, companies and IT security functions and MSPs for that matter. Limited time, people and money. Where do we focus those limited resources? That requires a plan. It requires prioritizing relevant areas of focus. I can tell you from my marathon plan, I ran five days a week, up to 56, 60 miles a week, some fast, some more longer and a bit slower, some hills, some intervals, you name it, I was doing it. But they were tied to prioritize areas, whether that be maybe weaknesses in my running and having to strengthen certain areas. And cyber is no different. And it's, oh, that's where the risk management comes in. And we'll talk about that in detail in a few slides. It's prioritizing where we use those limited resources that mitigate risk for the business in the most effective way to reduce it to an acceptable level. And that plan is the risk management plan tied to prioritizing those areas of risk. The final thing I want to say, it's about resilience. And I can tell you, mile 18 to 22, you're in the hurt locker in a marathon, no matter how much training you've done, and it requires resilience and having a plan to cater for that. Cyber, again, if an incident happens or an attack happens, you have to be resilient. You have to have an incident response plan. You have to have a team that knows how to make decisions when you're confronted with maybe some ethical, moral, and legal questions. Case in point, ransomware, do I pay the ransom? No, I don't advocate you pay the ransom. I'm against it because that is perpetuating more and more of that happening. But if you are a business that's going to go out of business because you don't have time to restore from backups or you don't have backups or the backups fail to restore, you're going to be faced with that. So being resilient is about, again, working as a team, tabletop exercise, testing the plan and working through something that sometimes feels insurmountable. And I can tell you, Martin, sometimes feels insurmountable. But guess what? You get through it and you get to the finish line because as a team, you will do it. So hopefully after today's session, you're going to be armed with maybe some new tools and new ways of approaching this. So as we get into this, it's always very important to think like a hacker, to understand who the threat actors are. Uh, the sun is coming in on top of me here in Ireland. Who knew that the sun could come in like this? But that all said, the range of sophistication of our attackers ranges from low to high. I've used this slide for many, many years. It hasn't really changed a whole lot. Low sophistication will be the lone casual hobbyist that may be, you know, up to curios curiosity, mischief, um, defacing websites, for example. Are they relevant to most businesses? Probably not. But you have to be aware of them so that if something happens, you respond to it. You then go up into hacktivists, such as Anonymous, Lulsec. They're all about disruption, sometimes humiliation. They have political aims. They launch denial of service type attacks, social media attacks, data breaches. If they don't like what a company says or they don't like what a senior executive says, they may take umbrage and actually focus their efforts in focusing on that organization, for example. 
or the individual, Larry Ellison, Oracle, he famously once said, no one can hack me within 24 hours. He was compromised because he said the wrong thing publicly. I've had to speak to senior executives and organizations about this. Be careful what you say in case it brings unwanted attention. And it should be fed into the risk register depending on who you are and what organization you are. Again, is it relevant to most organizations? Not necessarily, no. But here, organized criminals, these are very relevant to everybody, both at home, in their personal lives, as well as in the organizations that we work in, no matter what size you are. They want to make money and they are making tons of money. It's about online fraud and extortion. Random mainstream malicious software. You've got people working together in disparate groups, fully commercialized, and I'll give some examples of this in a few minutes, writing ransomware, writing software that evades detection, support desks that support people who are using uh, criminal commercial packs that can be used to run global uh, phishing campaigns, ransomware as a service, phishing as a service, quishing as a service, the new QR code type scenarios that are happening. Again, lots of different groups specializing in services that they provide to this underworld. It's not just one organization or one person, it's lots of different people. Sometimes they don't even know each other, but they go on a ranking system. How can, how can criminals uh, trust each other when well, it's based on a rating system or you know, a, a ranking? Then you go up into high advanced persistent threats. This can be very targeted against specific organizations, intellectual property theft, espionage, targeted malicious software to get into a corporate network based on known software and systems that they use. Why? Because they want to maybe bring a new product to market. They see somebody else doing it. It could be a nation state wanting to launch a whole new commercial sector. They see that another country specializes in doing it, so they target those companies to steal their IP to then give their own um, citizens and companies a leg up. This happens. Sometimes they'll use organized criminals to do it so that it's obfuscated and that law enforcement don't know who to track. They don't know who's behind it. And yes, this, whether it be stealing data that's about to be announced to the market that affects stock prices, whether it be intellectual property, whether it be COVID vaccines, for example. And there's a lot happening right now around crypto and financial service systems and vaccines and obviously healthcare. And that's something that organizations need to be mindful of. Now, interestingly, I'm not saying nation states or advanced persistent threats are targeting this sector, but the educational sector is under a particular threat at the minute. Why? Because there's a lot of data there around student data, financial data, universities, a lot of IP, startups working there in their incubation, incubator hubs and whatnot. And this is something that's constantly being targeted. I think the five eyes in the, the espionage and governmental cybersecurity agencies um, have been talking about this in, in recent days. So again, it's something to be mindful of. The key takeaway from this point, this slide, is there's different threat actors, they range in sophistication, they have different motivations and methods. What is relevant to you and your organization determines what threats, what risks you need to prioritize in your risk register. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So some examples of activity. Again, I've used these slides over many years because they haven't really changed. It's a great way of depicting it. Crime packs. Anyone on this call, 3VRI or anyone else that's on here can lease these crime packs for $50, $100 a month. You get a full support desk behind you where you can call in and say you're having difficulties. They will help you. They give you Power BI type statistics where you're tracking how effective your criminal campaigns are, your phishing campaigns, your quishing, your SMS, malware. How effective is it? Is it, is it compromising Java, PDF? Is it compromising various browsers that are out there? Is it compromising various operating systems? What countries are most susceptible? There's a susceptibility rating that they're able to assess who's gullible and they'll retarget those folks for maybe phone calls offering fake antivirus premium support and people buy it. And that's because they're tracking the effectiveness of their campaigns. But guess what happens? If they suddenly see a drop off in the effective rating, they get a free upgrade 
of the software so that it's no longer going to be blocked or detected by the very pieces of software companies implement antivirus, endpoint protection, firewalls, IDS, IPS, every one of those tools. Cyber criminals know about them. They use them themselves because you've got specialized people who write malicious software who then give it to another specialized group who test that software to verify it's not going to be blocked or detected. That's why you see continued infections happening within organizations because they're bypassing controls. And that's why you will always hear multiple layered of defenses because nothing is foolproof. We all know that. And that's why the last mile in security and given it's October and Security Awareness Month, people, we need to help staff. And we can't think that we're going to throw technology at that. We have to help people. Quick disclaimer, please don't visit these uh, domains or websites uh, just in case something happens. It's purely for informational purposes. Now, these criminal gangs who write malicious software, who test then the malicious software, they then sell it on dark web marketplaces. They'll do price drops year on year. So here we have a product that does malicious software, Europe fresh, high quality per 1,000 installs. It was 2,500 in 2021. It's now 1,800 in 2022. Guaranteeing high quality malicious software to be installed without detection, 1,800 bucks. People are able to buy it and then they go into the crime pack and then are mass used by all the different folks who use it. Various different countries, whether it be California, whether it be USA, UK, Australia, again, different quality, different prices. This is what is happening behind the scenes. Global marketplace, all about making money by different providers. You then have stolen credit cards and they get sold. I talked about how do you trust criminals? Well, you've got different levels, different star ratings. It's all you can go on. How reliable was the data that I got when I bought it off you? How good was the credit cards? How good was the malicious software? All those things, they are constantly assessing them. This one is about access to bank accounts. Again, some people specialize in compromising machines, getting onto the machine. They then sell that access to somebody else who specializes in maybe getting into bank accounts. Guess what happens? That person who gains access to the bank account then sells that access to somebody else who specializes in getting the money out of the bank account. You may have heard of money mules where people are sent emails. Normally it's 18 to 24 year olds, but maybe depending on uh, various parts of the world, it could be anyone else who's hard of, you know, hard up and they need more money. They get an email saying, hey, uh, would you be open to me being able to use your bank account? I'll put in a thousand if you can then um, take out 800 and send it back to me. This here is a different flip on that, which is someone sells access to a bank account of $20,000 in it and they sell the access for a thousand. That person then says, oh, I'm going to get that money out and I'll instruct various people to go to ATMs at a certain time to get the money out of that bank account. You may wonder, how did they get into the bank accounts? They clone legitimate banking websites. They wait for the person to go onto them and then they wait to see what gets typed in from username, password and the two-factor codes. The person thinks they're logging into the real banking website when in fact they're not, they're logging into the clone. The criminal is logging into the real website. And what they're being challenged with is what they challenge the person on the fake site. And that's how they get it, yeah, access to the bank account. So now that we've talked about the threat actors, the threat scape, some examples of actually how they go about doing this. Cyber as a business risk. This is why we're here, folks. Without the business, there's no need for security, right? So it's very important when we're looking for budget, when we're focusing on areas to focus on, prioritize risk management, what does the business worry about? We have to align our IT and our IT security strategies with the business strategy because the business must always win. We can't get in the way of the business, but we can definitely help that business, whether it be com competitive advantage or whether it be pure risk management and we speak the same language as most other parts of that business will, which would be risk and risk register, operational risk, for example, financial risk, all that. Global business leaders were assessed. Allianz report, fantastic report every year. It's worldwide. Business executives respond to it. 
here you can see cyber incidents is the number one concern for businesses around the world. That was number two and three in recent years. COVID was higher. But you'll notice business interruption is second. The two of them go hand in hand. Cyber incidents lead to business interruption. And so therefore, these are the top risks that businesses are worried about. So now is our time. It's about how can we ensure we're managing the right areas. And hopefully the next few slides will guide us through that. Now, while cyber incidents is the concern, what specific cyber exposures are companies worried about? Ransomware. That went slightly down last year, albeit it was extremely high. Business email compromise, fake, e fake invoices, fake supplier, changing of bank details, for example, the CEO fraud type scenarios, that is still ever present. But ransomware is making a robust uh, return to being number one. Only have to look at cyber insurance claim statistics. Uh, those are, everyone that's on this session today, refer to cyber insurance information. It is gold dust. It tells you everything that's going on and where you maybe can protect yourselves ahead of the time um, and areas of focus because the cause of claims, that could be something that comes to your door and you can try and get ahead of it. But ransomware is one and then data breaches is second. And this is so important because it then leads to, okay, if businesses and my business leaders are talking to other business leaders in their networks, I need to be going into meetings. And professionally, you will succeed and be very successful because they'll be waiting for you to be talking about these very things. So now from a business perspective, well, there's different businesses. No one business is the same, depending on the sector you're in, depending on the size of the organization that you're in, how much data, what type of data, do, do you have bank accounts, customer banks, uh, customer banking information, your own company information, like legal, you have customer funds, you've got company funds, you've got intellectual property, you've got all sorts of information in there. Again, different levels of risk, maybe to an auctioneers where they're selling properties. Again, they're not, they're not gonna have anywhere near the same type of data, but there is risk. But ultimately, there's no such thing as perfect protection. But again, limited resources. Where do we focus and prioritize? It's understanding our business. If I'm a small business, I'm less complex. I have little to no at much technology in play. I may only use email. I may access the internet. I may have one or two laptops if I'm a very small business. There's a low maturity, clearly, of security in that organization because they don't have the resources. There's not a huge amount of funds to focus on it but there is a higher risk as a consequence of something happening. But as businesses grow, they get more complex, more data, for example, more people. It then starts to increase the complexity and the maturity must increase to mitigate those risks. Yes, there's gonna be a higher cost to mitigating those risks, but again, there has to be a balance of sustainability as in the need to protect against the need to run. And this is why risk management is so important. Current cyber risk management approaches. Um, you may laugh at the first one, doing nothing, maybe buying cyber insurance and thinking that that's enough. Yes, people are doing it all the time. And that's why cyber insurance is kicking back now and saying there has to be mandatory controls in place um, before you even get it. And why? Because there's been so many claims and they've lost a lot of money. Cyber insurance has increased off the back of it. It's now a hard market. A hard market is where premiums have gone up. Excuse me. So doing nothing is clearly not, not viable for anybody. Compliance based. Oh, I'm gonna be GDPR compliant. I'm gonna be CCPA or Poppy Act. I'm gonna be ISO 27001 or NIST or COVID. Or I'm going to align to the security framework. And that can be an approach that people undertake. Industry average, accept, accept the same level of risk as others in the same sector, spend the same. Why? Because people don't want to gild the lily. They don't want it, they want it to be an industry issue if something happens. Oh, I did the same as everybody else. This is what people do from an approach perspective. The other aspect is risk-based and that's either qualitative or quantitative. And that's basically looking at risks at an inherent level, which is without any controls, and then residual, which is after you've mitigated them with controls. 
That's the language businesses want to hear. Inherent residual. Getting residual risk to an acceptable level, that's what business leaders want. Now, how do we get there? There's two called out, qualitative and quantitative. I would say everybody in this room is doing qualitative. And there's an example of this coming up where use of heat maps and saying based on probability and impact, we are able to get a high level overview qualitatively as to where that risk is. But I see that changing to quantitative where there's actual numbers, dollar numbers being used and coming up with proper ways of assessing probable max losses tied to budget spend and where we can increase or decrease the dial to have a bigger effect that ultimately reduces the risk to that acceptable level. My observations, compliance base, very passive, it's a tick the box approach, very subjective efficacy of the controls. It's down to the people who are involved in assessing those risks, assessing the effectiveness of the controls that have been bought. I am very different to another CISO in another organization. They may feel that certain controls are way more effective than I would say they are. So it comes down to the people involved. It's easy to defend from a budgetary perspective. We spent X and we believe we are compliant. Senior executives, maybe they're happy with that. I don't know. The other side, industry average, it's very conservative. Again, a tick the box approach. Why? Because it's bare minimum controls. It's not going beyond uh, what other people are doing. But let's take a look at that for a second. How do you know what other people are truly doing? How do you know what they're actually spending? It's third hand information. But guess what happens? Let's say next year, everybody in the same sector suddenly increases their budgets by a million dollars. Does that mean you have to suddenly do that? Taking control of your own destiny is way more important and understanding the relevant risks to you and your business. You may have a completely different book of business. You may have different suppliers. You may have different clients. You may be managing different types of data on behalf of those clients, even though you may be in the same sector. But this is, you know, I've seen this firsthand. Don't gild the lily was a famous expression that was told um, to myself. It's financially driven by senior executives more often than not. Now to come back to the risk based on probability and impact, qualitative versus quantitative. I said at the start, qualitative is typically more used than anything else. Use of heat maps, they give a very good high level overview. And it's easy to digest and understand where we are. But articulating the efficacy of controls and the financial effectiveness of those controls, that is not really answered very well when using that. Quantitative is data driven, using risk simulation analysis, like Monte Carlo type simulations, looking at tail events. What is the max loss? What's the likelihood of that? scientifically looking at this. Yes, it's harder to do, I get it. Maybe you've never seen it, <coughs> excuse me. But I guarantee you with a little bit of effort, it then becomes repeat and rinse, tied to each individual type of risk that you're looking at and worried about, tied to those relevant threat actors to your business. And you will be able to effectively show the dollar impact and, of what you buy and how it reduces the, the, the probable maximum loss to your organization tied to those risks. So qualitative, typically it looks like a risk severity heat map, right? So you've got rare up to almost certain probability, and then you have impacts, whether that be insignificant, true to severe. But again, who decides this? Who decides whether it's minor impact? Who's involved in those conversations? Is it IT, is it IT security? Is it based on the CISO and the peer groups and the sessions they attend and they hear? Or is it the senior executive, the C-suite, the chief risk officer, the financial officer, the CEO, for example? It really depends. And then decided this then, where, where is the dollar values? There's no dollar values. We get into heat maps here, which says, oh, um, there's a critical impact here. Very, you know, it's unlikely that something's ever going to happen. But, you know, this is what it looks like on our heat map. There's no dollar value attributed to this. And what's happening, boards and leadership teams, they want more insights. 
they, you know, what's the financial impact of a potential data breach? How can you get that? How much is the cost of remediating the risk versus accepting it? Again, it's not seen here. Are our cybersecurity investments proportionate to our risk exposure? Are we underspending or are we overspending? Again, qualitative, they serve a purpose. Good at giving an overview, good at explaining this in a very quick and easy way, but really where we're going to get to, I think, is quantitative. And wouldn't it be great to be able to go into a board meeting or a security steering committee? If, by the way, if you don't have a security steering committee, I highly recommend you do. Getting the senior stakeholders in an organization that represent all areas of the business, that they own the risks, that they call out assets and risks that they perceive. And then together, everybody works through managing the risk. And here you can see risk without any treatment at all based on you know, quantitative dollar value assessment of certain risks based on the projected or probable max loss and the probability of, of certain eventualities, you get to a place where you can say 80% of our losses equal or below to $1 million without any treatment. Okay, so if we have a you know, probable max loss of a $1 million and I'm only spending 50 or $60,000 on my security, um, we need to think about this a little bit more. And after treatment, you could then say, okay, 80% of losses are equal or below 580,000. This is down to running Monte Carlo type simulations or using surveys to feed into a particular type of for, uh, formula that again is rinse and repeat. And is so effective when it comes to security budgetary planning, where you can demonstrate the effectiveness of what you spend. Step one, estimating the potential loss for the organization. So here's an example from Ponemon 2021 survey, a data loss scenario, right? So you've got data exfiltration and business disruption, loss estimates, okay? They range from less than 10 million to greater than 500 million. Why? Obviously this survey, there was I think 591 respondents to it, variations in size, the organizations, the sectors that they operate in, as I alluded to earlier on, no one business is the same. But this is data loss information that has been responded to, and you can see data exfiltration costs or business disruption costs and the percentages of those that have responded to this. So once you have those figures, you can be feeding them either into the formula that I'm about to show you or Monte Carlo type simulations. Step two, estimating the probability of a successful attack. And you would do this based on the different types of attack, ransomware, malware, business email compromise. You do it per each different scenario that you are concerned about that is relevant to your business. In this case, 38% of organizations surveyed estimated the likelihood of an attack causing business disruption to be greater than 2%. So here we are here, we're over here, 2%, greater than 2%, 38%, and then 41% likelihood of data exfiltration to be greater than 2% of likelihood, right? So based on those respondents, one, an organization would determine what is relevant to me and how would I apply it then to the formula, which may look a little bit daunting at, at first, but really it's quite simple. So have, based on the probable max loss that we talked about in step one, the likelihood of that occurrence from step two, you can then work out what the cost potentially is, the total estimated cost, in this case, $5.6 million. Because if I'm going to have business disruption and data exfiltration costs, because sometimes there's liability costs, there's obviously the impact of getting back up and running, all that good stuff, is quantifying what that looks like. And the 137.2 million, the 117, again, that comes back from this type of survey. Data driven. Take it step four, and you can really get scientific into this. Determining the estimated likelihood, likelihood of an attack, but looking at this using Bayes' theorem, 
Now, Bayes' theorem is great at describing the probability based on a controlled set of events. Here, you have a phishing attack. It hits a firewall. You have a firewall that's 95% effective. 5% gets through. Okay, great, 5% gets through. What happens now? You may have malware, endpoint protection, or some other anti-malware products. It's 77% effective. 23% gets through, which then leaves 1.15% of the original threat out there. It gets to a person. And through security awareness training and whatnot, 67% have prevented it. But now we're left with 0.38% of a probability of that attack. And we can use that 0.38% in many ways now. And what I mean by that is you're able to start looking at what the cost would be based on that 0.38%. If it be malware, ransomware, business email compromise, or credential loss. You've got the data exfiltration cost, which is probable max loss, but based on the probability, you would have 3.15 million of data exfiltration cost. Business disruption, 2.1, so you end up with 2.46 million off the top of the probable max loss. This organization has 13.39 million in terms of annual total expected costs if these issues or incidents were to occur. Again, every organization is different, but you can apply this to your organization and get to a place where, hang on a second, see this firewall is only 95% effective. What if I bought a new firewall that was 97.5% effective? I would be reducing my risk by half here straight away. And if you can reduce it by half there, obviously it's going to be a lot smaller, which means you're going to be reducing the cost of the incident. Now that's looking at the effectiveness of one control. You could also look at ways of mitigating the probable max loss, which would be, oh, do I need to have that data anymore? Do I need all that type of data? So operationally, you can make changes that can affect the probable max loss. So hopefully this has been informative in bringing to life how one can approach this in a quantitative way and not just qualitative. To wrap up on this, build a comprehensive profile of your assets. Know where they're stored, transported and processed. We're all in the cloud, understand that more than anything else. Cloud providers will give you the environments, but they won't. Obviously, you're going to be incumbent to protect that, and you'll be the controller. Capture the financial consequences of a threat being realized. Work with different people in your organization that can help you with that. Determine the most likely loss outcomes using simulations. Again, you can quickly research this, and people can help. And then document and report this back to management so that you can work together on budgets and policies and procedures. Prioritizing risks based on their financial impact and probability is the best way for going forward for any organization to determine where they spend and use those limited resources, as I said at the start. So moving on into human risks, again, 88% of data breaches, we talked about it earlier on from a business risk, ransomware and data breaches top risks that businesses are worried about. Security Awareness Month, we're focusing on people. I hope you're all having very successful campaigns that you're running um, during the month of October. As Treva noted, we have a various kit. We have a kit that you can avail of. Um, happy to talk about that afterwards. I think Treva was going to put the link into the chat. But when we know that 88% 80, are caused by the actions of people, more often than not, accidentally, it tells us we have to focus on the people side. And the people side or insider threat, as it's often referred to, you've got three components. You've got the malicious insider. Again, I've had to deal with this. Someone who's passed up for promotion is not happy with the salary that they're, that they're being given. Um, they may have been approached by somebody else to steal certain information and they've got money for it. God knows what happens behind closed doors. This can happen. And it's about being aware of this 
and understanding that that can happen and again incident response and the resilience piece that I talked about knowing what to do if it happens it's a HO problem but using our security tools we can be monitoring and detecting certain actions pre-resignation type activities for example so that's one side but really it's about accidental insiders the inadvertent clickers the inadvertent downloaders of free software convenience seekers where they've got the same password across multiple accounts, giving away their uh, credentials to children at home, for example, those very same children then downloading free software, or the person is downloading it because someone had said you should do it. Putting passwords into spreadsheets that departments all have access to. I've seen it happen before where spreadsheets, lots of different username and passwords to bank accounts was available on a corporate network for everybody. There was several billion dollars in those bank accounts and anybody could have used the credentials to log in. But coming back to the accidental insider who downloads software or clicks on links or opens email attachments or gives away their credentials onto fake login pages, they then become the compromised insider. And someone will impersonate that user, access the, the data and the systems that that person would legitimately have access to. So it's about raising awareness as to the different types of insiders and again deciding what's relevant to your organization and how do we tackle that from a, an awareness perspective and a culture perspective. And office behaviors, so how can we inform behavior? We talked about the clicking on links already. Passwords, incrementing a number by one or trying to be super clever and decreasing by one. Yes, we know, cyber criminals also know that that's what people are doing. Unsafe web browsing. Again, we don't realize by going to certain websites. Drive-by downloads can happen on any particular website. Why? Because those websites may have a vulnerability that gets exploited by somebody and you just happen to browse there. As soon as you hit the page, drive-by download, you get infected by whatever is on that um, page. Weak data protection practices. Again, having data all over corporate networks, everybody can have access to it. Now, I'm not advocating that one looks at data leakage prevention, DLP. I find that that's too heavy. Project never really gets fully done. And the impact on an organization is very profound. Now, again, it is relevant to certain organizations, depending on who they are and the sectors that they operate in. But I rather found data governance to be a better compromise, where you know where the data is, you know who needs to have access to that data, and then you monitor controls and you're able to determine uh, who needs access and who doesn't need access, and you do that on an ongoing basis. That's far better um, in most organizations and doesn't get in the way. And then the final piece, little to no understanding of security policies. Again, if I was to ask everybody on this call today, who knows what's in your security policies, you're probably gonna go, haven't you? Apart from the one or two people who will put their hand up and say, actually I do. They may be a little bit defensive or maybe a bit proud about that. I know who you are. Big shout out to you. You've written the policies. Okay, I guess I was that person too. But the reality is all your staff members and your colleagues don't because they're too long. They don't feel it's relevant. There is the opportunity. How can we make it relevant? Delivering bite-sized chunks of policies in response to what we see people doing on the network, that's a eureka moment. That's a light bulb moment. It also helps tackle the issue, well, guess what? If you update that policy and do not communicate it, how can you enforce it? You can't, unless you've told people. How do you tell them? You only get it once a year, all right? So these are behaviors, these are issues that need to be tackled. And I think October, but also year round, there are ways to tackle these and raise awareness. That is helpful, both at home and in the workplace. Now, security awareness program problems. Now, one, which I'll go into now in a second, is about repeat offenders in phishing simulations, right? How do we quantify to senior management why we see repeat offenders? Is it the context and the complexity of the lure? And when you have a, a product or whatever that's, that's being used, it may say high, medium, and low sophistication. But every organization is different. How can we quantify high, medium, and low when we go back to the board and say, oh, we've got certain individuals repeat offenders? It's, wouldn't it be great to be able to quantify how complex the test was and maybe why we're seeing repeat offenders? It'll help put it into perspective. 
And we'll talk about that in a second. But security awareness program problems typically is spray and pray. We're spraying training to everybody. We send it to everybody, it's huge cost. We're taking everyone away from their day jobs to train. Why not use a quiz or an assessment to determine who needs help and who doesn't need help? That dramatically reduces the cost of running a training program, reduces the cost of the business, makes everyone more effective, more productive, more of the time. And you don't antagonize people who come up and say, I know that, you should have known that I knew that. Well, I'd be making an assumption, people just come up, um, particularly from IT development teams, and they claim to know everything about cybersecurity, and they knew more than most. But when you start talking about GitHub and downloading software and uploading free software, hard coding of passwords into Wikipedia pages, uh, even into software programs, that's when the light bulb moment went off for them. That they were like, oh, they don't, they didn't think of those risks. But I'm gonna get, uh, get brought down a rabbit hole there. Essentially, there's a way to target training to those who need it and not just be a tick the box exercise. And knowing who to train is often down to specific behavior that we see on corporate networks. So if you're an MSP providing network monitoring, or if you're an end user who has a SIEM product, you can see what staff are doing and you can train in response to this. And then the final piece is actually, how can we measure the effectiveness of the program? Oh, 90% of people have taken my training courses. Okay, that's great. What does that tell us? Other than 10% didn't, it just says we've done a whole lot of stuff, but I've no idea that actually people took it on board. Oh, they answered eight out of 10 questions correctly. Okay, how many times did you give them a chance to get the eight out of 10? Oh, they had two or three times to retake it. Well, guess what? They're learning based on what they got wrong, and then they're trying it again. Why do I know this? I've seen it. People are open and honest at the Christmas party. <laughs> they talk about these things. So if we know that that's what's happening, break away knowledge assessments, separate them from courses, ask the questions pre and post training. A, because you'll find out pre, who needs training and who doesn't, and then post, how effective was it? Are they answering the questions correctly or not? Having that data tells you then how effective it is, not just completion rates. And the same with phishing simulations. What is the susceptibility looking like over time based on the context and the difficulty rating of phishing tests? Now, the next slide I want to talk about is something I came across very recently, and uh, I believe it was from NIST. Big call out to them for this. I hadn't seen it before, and I think it's brilliant. So when you go in to explain the latest phishing simulation test result, and you say, oh, we've got 10%, we've got repeat offenders, we don't know why they're doing it. This is where you start getting, oh, name and shame, right? Totally dead against that. That, can't, that goes against everything that you want to do in building trust and camaraderie with your fellow colleagues. Looking at the phishing lure itself, it's either going to be very difficult, moderate difficult, or least difficult, right? But how do we come up with the test itself? It can't just be high, medium, low. You have a concept of cues, which are the telltale signs in the phishing lure, and then you've got the relevant content or context within the phishing lure itself. If you have many cues, it stands to reason that that is a least difficult type lure because it should be there for all to see telltale signs that it's a test or a phishing email. Right? But if there's very few cues, well, now we're getting into difficulty. Difficult to detect. You then add the relevancy of the lure to the organization or the individuals or the department or the country that you're sending it to. Now we're getting into another level of assessment of or measuring the lure. High amount of relevancy to an organization, it's gonna be quite difficult to detect, all right? So when looking at that, well, how do we look at what defines many cues or some cues or few cues? What defines high relevancy or medium relevancy or low relevancy? Feast your eyes, right? Different types of cues, so errors, technical indicators, visual presentation, language and content, common tactics, okay? Few will be one to eight of these cues. 
Some will be 9 to 14, and many will be 15 plus. Looking at the premise or the context, that relevancy piece, so it mimics a workplace process or practice, has relevance to the workplace, aligns with other situations or events internal, um, sorry, including external to the workplace, engenders concern over consequences for not clicking, as being the subject of targeted training. So let's say you have done some training or given specific warnings on this, this may reduce the relevancy of the impact of the law. Okay? And using a numeric scale, like a scoring system, you can then quantify based on summing up the values of these elements. So one through four, sum them up and you get 20, based on the specific law you're you know, measuring. You can then detract how much you would deem to have been you know, educated people already about this, and you could get 16. Okay, so based on 16, where does that fit from my measurement of my fishing lure? Well, it's medium. Okay, so it's medium. High will be 18 and above in terms of relevancy. 10 and below will be low relevancy of the lure to the target audience. And when you get to quantify this to the senior executives, I think this is absolutely brilliant, where high relevancy to an organization, very few cues, God damn right, that's very difficult. And that's why we're seeing repeat offenders, because we're sending out very difficult lures. Oh, I'm seeing moderately difficult uh, repeat offenders, or at least difficult uh, repeat offenders. That shapes the narrative. It quantifies where the risk lies within the organization far better than we use the high, medium, or low lure. Again, I love this. Hopefully, it's new to yourselves on the call today and will really help you guys as you're you know, speaking to your senior management and quantifying the results. Again, security awareness is not just about phishing simulations, it's about training, it's about different types of um, content, courses, videos, town halls, culture sessions, quizzes, lunch and learns. Mapping out your calendar year is very, very important running themes, getting your security champions across the organizations, looking at posters for whatnot, um, but, you know, the multitude of content that can be sent out here. Tie it to your policies. Break down your policies into the snippets tied to these various themes that you want to talk about. Map out your phishing campaigns. How often are you going to do it? Who are you going to target? What types of lure based on the new measurement that I've just shown you there? Okay, it requires thought, but it's a year-round thing. It's not just October. So in wrapping up um, for today's session, conscious of time, um, actually three minutes left, wow. Um, key takeaways that I would highly recommend. Identify your key assets at risk and the weaknesses. What do I mean? Systems, the third party, the people. Understand those. Look at your qualitative and quantitative risk measurement. Don't just rely on qualitative. Look at the quantitative. Put a strong cybersecurity steering committee in place. What do I mean strong? I mean every areas of the business that have the ability to make decisions and own the risks. Yes, we can educate that steering committee members as to the risks that they need to be mindful of. Classic example for me was, spoke to somebody in the business, oh, we've nothing of intrinsic value, never had, never been an issue for 20 years, nothing to see here, we're good. Okay, great, went around, CFO, really worried about making SEC filings in various parts of the year, CEO had concerns, other parts of the business had concerns around certain types of data. Went back to down to the individual, turns out we had a third party who gave us data, some personal information around like that, very valuable data. If something happened that data on our watch, it would be a big issue for the business. And that then became a material risk that had to be sorted out. And it was only through dialogue that that came out. That feeds into creating a culture of cybersecurity and a think tank approach. Wouldn't it be great if you have a project team working in a room where you're not even present and they're talking about new data gathering project and someone says, oh, I don't like the amount of data we're gathering. I don't like where we're going to store it. I don't like the questions we're asking. Do we really need all that data? That is a culture of awareness. 
incident response plan, don't just write it, test it. Get people in there that can make the decisions if you're ever faced with various issues, ransomware being a key one, extortion, not pleasant, but it's happening. Sock and seam, look at your MSP partners. Make sure you're monitoring for events, monitor the behaviors of staff, so that informs what you train and snippets you give to those folks. Goes without saying, multiple layered defenses tied to the relevant threats to your business. And vulnerability assessment, patch management, multi-factor authentication, and the password management piece that we talked about. Okay, I hope you found today informative. Again, any questions, please send them through now, or we can follow up afterwards. My email is sburk.titanhq.com. I want to say a huge thank you for joining today, and take care. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. Uh, lots of great takeaways there. Um, I'll just run through a question or two just before we finish out. If anyone that has to leave, uh, we will be sending out the recording so you won't miss out too much and you can watch it back whenever. So, um, yeah, if there's any questions coming through, please do send them. I know some people might have to, maybe five o'clock, might have to jump off. I do have a couple of questions here. Stephen, I'll just run through quickly with you, if that's okay. Yep. Let's see. Two seconds, I'll just have a read. Do we have any training videos for awareness training on the various types of attacks? Yep, so we have a very large library. Um, social engineering, uh, CEO fraud, um, the multitude of social engineering attacks that can happen. So whether it be quishing, whether it be WhatsApp, so wishing, SMS, smishing, email, voice, physical, social engineering, um, they're all there on the platform and in various formats, whether that be course or whether that be video format. Brilliant. We can send you a follow up um, with kind of more about our training that we offer. Um, so we have another one here, we'll quickly go to that. Um, Stephen, do you have any advice in instilling a security awareness culture through to employees across various different uh, departments uh, in a kind of positive way? Sure. Um, obviously, I've mentioned security champions. So having your security champions in the business is very important because they're going to be your representative across different countries, departments, offices, for example. They'll know the, how that office or department works. That can inform the, the method of delivery and the format of the content, which is in keeping with the culture of that organization. Financial services, insurance tends to be a bit more conservative. IT software type houses tend to be more technical and less formal, and the format can sometimes be humorous, for example. That doesn't always, you know, you have multitudes in between. That's first thing. Two is determining the levels of risk uh, within the, the, the various offices and departments and those individuals, and again, what content is relevant to them. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to messaging from the senior executive within that organization that explains why this is important. Um, yes, we're investing in cybersecurity technical controls. We don't want to get in your way, but unfortunately, we're not going to block everything. So we're here to help you. We're here to help raise awareness that is effective for you and your family, but at home as well as in the workplace. Um, we will run phishing simulations, but again, it's to only show you the latest threats so that you are armed and can report it to us. We will send you training courses and videos and policies so that you're aware of the controls we need to abide by. Sometimes they're legal requirements. Sometimes it's just we feel that that's the best approach. So communication and bringing everybody on a journey together. Again, one of my CEOs um, always said, you can't go from zero to 100, but you have to bring a company on a journey. And that, that's all down to communication. Um, and again, if you can articulate that tied to the relevant risks that you face as an organization or what you have seen in the past or behaviors that you've seen in the past, quantifying and explaining the impact that that could have on the organization, people will buy in and uh, row in behind you and help you. 
Brilliant. I've got another question, kind of same idea. I'm not sure if this covers it, but um, a recent poll said they were aware, or 80% of people said they are aware of security issues. So how do we change the behaviour to act on security issues? So that's a good question. Um, so, 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 so I get it right again. So how do we act on security issues? Is it? So, sorry, in a recent poll, 80% said they were aware of security issues. So how do we change the behaviour to act on the security issues? So changing the behaviour to... Yeah, I think issue. it's about what I, what I described there a few seconds ago. It's about communication and bringing to life the consequences of an impact of an incident and what could be the causes of that incident. Obviously, we don't want to clearly call out individuals or specifically say you've done this or you've done that because that's going to alienate people and that's not good. But if we can say we have seen examples of these behaviours in the organisation, we didn't have an incident, but this is what has happened to other organisations. If that happened to us, the dollar value would be this. It could be material. It may not be. But at the same time, no one is ever going to want to be the cause of an issue. The, the embarrassment of it alone. Um, as I say, it's about bringing people on a journey and bringing what is relevant in terms of the issues tied to the relevant risks and the systems that we have. And again, different companies have invested differently. They may have invested a lot of money or they may not have invested a lot of money. And again, that context feeds into what one says or doesn't say. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, if not, I'm happy to follow up. Perfect, thank you. Just uh, one last one we have time for us, Stephen. Uh, one person asks, we have a very small business here and do you think that there's still a chance of a cyber attack even though we're only small, we're only a small size business? Uh, I'd love to say yes, but unfortunately no. Um, every company of every size is being impacted and unfortunately smaller businesses are getting caught in the the, main, the random mainstream delivery uh, of phishing campaigns and malicious software that's on various websites because they have vulnerabilities on them. A large logistic company, sorry, not large, uh, medium-sized organization in the UK just went out of business after a ransomware event. All the data, all the systems were brought down. They couldn't recover after six months, gone. I'm not trying to scare people by saying that. I'm bringing to life the true reality of this that every organization must be looking at this and saying, okay, I've got risk. I've got people that are being targeted. The cyber criminals are targeting people to get to the systems, to get to the data. They're targeting HR and finance departments with fake invoices. A supplier may be compromised and you get an email saying, oh, I've changed my bank details. Please wire all the money to this new bank account. And people change the bank account and they pay the invoices into the new bank account without really verifying on, the, on a phone call, for example. Um, Again, it depends on the type of data that you have. Do you have personal information? Do you have credit card information? Uh, it's no one size fits all, but small companies are definitely getting hit. And the average cost for an SME um, has gone up to about $270,000 in impact costs. And that's based on cyber insurance claims data. I was at Net Diligence in Philadelphia and that came out. So that quantifies for an SME what a typical impact cost would be. Wow, that's crazy. I just have one more, actually, we we'll have time for. Um, just in terms of examples of cyber attacks, from your experience, Stephen, is there any sort of attack or trend that you're seeing that may write, like we'll see more of in 2024? Uh, ransomware is not going anywhere. If anything, it's, it's getting more and more prevalent. Um, ransomware is typically born out of phishing emails um, or WhatsApp messages now. Um, and QR codes is feeding into it, but it's still email. Um, but also visiting websites and uh, malicious software, free software being downloaded, for example, uh, is causing ransomware infections. The cost of those um, ransoms are going up and up and up. Um, so that's not going to go anywhere. Um, and data exfiltration, which I talked about today, that is still happening. And I saw some examples there recently where the threat actors are on networks for over 200 days before they're even noticed or detected. And then they just hit people on a late on a Friday night, typically on a long weekend. 
and um, they just take over organizations. And what happens is when, when you get hit once, um, there's a, a sucker value applied to this, which is, oh, uh, maybe I can reinfect that company a second and a third time. And that's what happened to one organization. They got infected three times and they had to pay three ransoms over the space of three weeks. So wow. that's not going away, going away. And business email compromise, so those fake invoices, um, fake supplier details, emails pretending to look like the CEO uh, or the CFO, for example, they're not going away. Um, they are the big ones that are happening right now. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Stephen. Um, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope you took um, a nice few takeaways to go with you there. We'll send out the slides and recording uh, um, in the follow up. And just one more thing we have for you, Austin, in the follow-up email as well. We've got the security awareness quiz available on our website right now. It's free for you to do. You can send to your employees, send to your, your clients, send to whoever you like. And it's just a way to discover your level of security awareness. Uh, it assesses different various aspects of cybersecurity, helping you identify kind of the areas that you, you may need to enhance. So yeah, so it's free to do and we'll send that around. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Stephen, thank you so much. That was just brilliant. I really enjoyed that personally. I'm sure everyone else did. Um, thanks so much, and hope we see you all again in our next webinar. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Bye. Bye.